Our next speaker is Tom Meyer. He's a historical consultant to the Northern Arapaho Tribe. He's been involved with Sand Creek since the late 1970s, I believe. Has been a, a friend and advisor to the um, to the to the Northern Arapaho Tribe, and a very very good friend and a constant companion to the National Historic Site. Tom. I too. I'm very honored and humbled to be here today. And I would not be here but for the good fortune of having met Eugene Ridgely Sr. on Northern Arapaho in 1985. And not long thereafter, his sons and daughters, Gail, Ben, Eugene Jr., Betty, and Eugenie. Over the next 20 years, Eugene became a close and trusted friend, and over those same years, he shared his life story. This morning, I'd like to tell you a part of that personal story to illustrate how various groups and governments have worked to foster a better understanding of the multi-generational impacts of the Sand Creek Massacre. A photograph of Eugene taken in 1993 appears on the screen. To begin with, let me quote Norbert Hill, the former chairman and longtime board member of the National Museum of the American Indian. He spoke the following words during a recognition ceremony held for Eugene in Boulder, Colorado in 1996. This celebration marks one of those significant healing events between two people. He went on to say, I knew in the first 30 seconds that this is not only a gentleman, but also a gentleman. And all the things that are said about him under underestimate the giant of the soul that he possesses as a teacher, mentor, and educator. I am honored to be, just be here and share this moment with you." Close quote. Eugene was born on the Wind River Reservation in 1926 and raised in a traditional Irish, or traditional Irish, traditional Indian way by his <clears throat> uh, maternal grandparents, George and Justina Shakespeare. According to the family oral history, George was a son of lame man, a survivor of the Sand Creek Massacre. Eugene's paternal grandfather was Ridge Bear, that is, until the government agent on the reservation began to anglicize Arapaho names. Thus, Ridge Bear became Ridgely, Scarface became Shakespeare, Lone Bear became Lon Brown, and so forth. Despite the anglicized names on the government's rolls, the Arapaho, like most tribes, continued their tradition of honoring their people with Indian names. Eugene's Arapaho name was Eagle Row. Responsibility was assigned to Eugene at an early age. His grandfather, George Shakespeare, gave Eugene his first horse and the responsibility for caring for it at the age of four or five. He also required that he and his cousin Richard Shakespeare water and care for the other horses in the family herd. In addition, he taught them how to hunt sage hens, tan animal skins, and make drums and shields from rawhide. Eugene also remembered his grandfather getting him up at 4 a.m. to go out and get the coal over at the Rogers place. He wrapped his feet in strips of cut, cut from gunny sacks and wore an old army coat that had been issued to his family. Ultimately, Eugene was required to attend the mission school, where his braids were cut off, he was forced to wear non-Indian clothes, and he was forbidden to speak the Arapaho language. He was physically punished whenever he spoke his native tongue and turned his head at the wrong time. He was told that his Indian way of life was a heathen way of life. Eugene went on to attend the public high school, work on haying crews during the summer, and sketch the lives and landscape around him. His artistic talent was already recognized. In fact, one of his high school teachers, Mrs. Brown, proudly kept a collection of his drawings, showing them to him later in life. He and his cousins also won many a horse race at the local fairs and rodeos. Coincidence marks several notable events in Eugene's story. In 1944, he caught the bus to Rollins, Wyoming, then the train to Denver, where he enlisted in the U.S. Army. The recruiting office at the old customs house on the corner of 16th and, was on a corner of the 16th and Arapahoe streets. 
The coincidence of an Arapaho youth from Wyoming enlisting in the Army on Arapaho Street in Denver was only one of several coincidences within a radius of a few blocks. To mention two others, the southern end of the train station in the rail yard sat aside an old Arapaho campsite that had been regularly occupied by the Arapahos both before and during the early years of Denver. Just up the street was the Blake and Williams Hotel, where on May 8, 1859, Eugene's great-great-great-grandfather, Arapaho Chief Little Raven, met with General William Larimer and a large party of Denver and Auraria citizens in one of the many attempts to seek accommodation. Little Raven also met with the Eastern newspaper correspondents, including Horace Greeley, who were visiting the gold fields. Chief Niwot, or left hand, often served as the interpreter. Returning to Eugene's story, he joined the army to fight for his native land. And an after an abbreviated basic training, he was shipped out to the South Pacific. And as they sailed from port, they were told that only half of them could expect to return. As a young private, Eugene was actively involved in the liberation of the Philippines. And he was awarded a bronze star for crawling out of his foxhole under heavy fire to rescue a wounded comrade. A brave warrior, he was also a compassionate human being. His unit always saved part of their rations for the hungry native populace. And Eugene took a six or seven year old Filipino orphan boy under his wing, providing him protection in his foxhole. The appreciative youth, however, had trouble pronouncing Eugene's military nickname, Chief referring to him instead as cheap. At the conclusion of the war, Eugene was sent to Panama to complete his tour of duty. The captain of his unit was recognized Eugene's talent for drawing and arranged for him to attend the respected art institute in Chicago. But Eugene loved the outdoors and returned to his home along the Little Wind River to pursue the independence of being a rancher. With his wife Lucille at his side, they raised chickens to trade for groceries and staples, acquired mismatched cattle, and used the GI Bill to take an agribusiness course. Within 15 years, Eugene developed a herd of over 300 Herefords, and followed in the steps of his grandfather, he raised quality quarter horses. By then, his sons Gail, Jean, Eugene, and Ben were hard at work helping to maintain the ranch and caring for the cattle. His daughters, Betty and Eugenie, were equally hard at work cooking and providing for the crew. Eugene served for three years on the board of trustees of the tribally owned Arapaho Ranch, traveling to the Nas National Western Stock Show in Denver to buy bulls to improve the quality of the tribal stock. Using his ranching experience and business savvy, he also served as a 4-H club leader for 20 years, was a member of the Arapaho Business Council for 16 years, and served on the school board for eight years. In 1966-67, he was cited by the American Legion Department of Wyoming for his exceptional leadership and service as a post commander. In 1980, his wife, Lucille, his true partner in life, died of cancer after suffering for over five years. Retiring from ranching in 1986, Eugene turned his full attention to preserving the Arapaho culture through his lifelong interest in traditional arts and crafts. In 1988, he was invited to display his work at the Heard Museum in Phoenix. In an exhibit brochure, it was noted that he employs the Plains Indian art tradition of painting historic scenes on the smooth surface of buffalo robes. About this time, Eugene and I began to discuss the possibility of a historic painting of the Arapahoes in Colorado. The discussion would come up on and off for the next five years. During that time, in 1988 and 89, Eugene won best of class at the Scottsdale All Indian Days Fine Arts and Crafts Show. In 1989 and 90, he received first place awards at the Northern Plains Tribal Arts Festival in Sioux Falls. In 1990, he was honored by the Wyoming Indian Association Parent of the Year as the Parent of the Year for the educational opportunities he provided to all five of his children, having sent them to college. In 1992, his granite sculpture, The Bison, was purchased by the collections of the Minneapolis Institute of Arts and included in their exhibition and publication, Visions of the People, a Pictorial History of the Plains Indian Life. 
Then on April 17, 1993, while eating lunch at a powwow in Fort Collins, Colorado, and discussing the possibility of a hide painting of the Arapahoes in Colorado, Eugene said he had also been thinking about the Sand Creek Massacre. He commented, however, that he might have trouble doing the parts that dealt with the savage treatment of children and the shooting of white antelope. Four months later, on August 16th, the decision was made to move ahead with the Sand Creek painting. It was completed in March of 1994, and when not entered in art shows, was on display at the Boulder Museum of History. That same year, Little Raven Street was dedicated in Lower Denver. In 1995, the Hyde painting was awarded a first-class ribbon at the Black Hills Juried Art Show, and both he and the Hyde were pictured in January-March 1966 issue of Native People's Magazine. An independent magazine at the time, it was published in Phoenix in affiliation with the Heard Museum, the National Museum of the American Indian in New York, the Smithsonian Institution, and other major museums. This issue of the magazine was eight years prior to the 2004 opening of the magnificent, magnificent facility we're in today. In August of 1996, the Colorado Historical Society the Colorado Department of Transportation, the Boulder Museum of History, and the Boulder Convention and Tis Visitors Bureau dedicated a roadside interpretive exhibit on US 36 overlooking entrance to the Boulder Valley. An image of Eugene's Helkide painting appeared in full color on that Arapaho panel, and a reception was held in his honor at the museum. It was an historic day. 138 years after the initial contact between the Arapaho people and the gold seekers of 1858-59, and 132 years after the Sand Creek Massacre of 1864, representatives of the Northern Arapaho tribe, the city of Boulder, and the state of Colorado gathered together in common interest. The mayor declared it to be Boulder Valley and Arapaho Indian Heritage Day and called for a new era of cooperation and exchange. David Hallis, the Colorado State Historian, outlined the Sand Creek Massacre in an articulate and powerful presentation. Al Addison, co-chairman of the Northern Arapaho Tribe, referred to Eugene as a true artist and historian, and that his work will continue on for better relationships between the non-Indians and all our Indian nations. In his 18 years on the Northern Arapaho Business Council, often as chairman, Al's deep interest, strong support, and steady hand on the Sand Creek Massacre Project are well known to all those who have been involved. He is joined here today by Councilman Willard Gould, who has also been extremely active in the Sand Creek matters during the past year. It was at this time that Norbert's Hill spoke. It was here, and it was also at this time, that he was serving as Executive Director of the American Indian Scientific and Engineering Society headquartered in Boulder, and again, a longtime member of the board directors of the National Museum of the American Indian. Norbert honored Eugene by saying, again, this celebration marks one of those significant healing events between two peoples. And again, I knew in the first 30 seconds that this is not only a gentleman, but also a gentle man. And all the things said about him underestimate the giant of a soul that he possesses as a teacher and mentor. I am honored to just be here and share this moment with you. Mary Lou Prosser of the Native American Rights Fund, whose headquarters are also in Boulder, told Eugene, we are very proud of what he has done to bring peoples together. Ben Sherman, an Ogallala Sioux Lakota, president of the Western American Indian Chamber and founder of the Native Tourism Alliance, quoted the words of Little Raven at the Treaty of Little Arkansas in 1865. It will be a very hard thing to leave the country that our creator gave us. Our friends are buried there. There at Sand Creek, White Antelope, and many other chiefs lie. Our women and children lie there. I do not feel disposed to ride off to a new country and leave them. Delmar Hamilton, who was chairman of the board of directors of the Denver Indian Center, said, I hope that there will be other such occasions in the future where the Arapaho people or other tribes can get together and share some fellowship and get to know one another a little bit better. I think that's the key to cooperation, he said to know each other, to find out how much you are alike. Delmar's Arapaho wife, Ava Hamilton, filmed the event. And a few days before the dedication, 
A letter arrived at the museum from U.S. Senator Ben Nighthorse Campbell saying, as one American artist to another, my best to Eugene J. Ridgely, Sr. The Heritage Day celebration and recognition of Eugene closed with a flag song and an honor dance by the Eagle Drum. In 1996, the members of this Arapaho drum group were primarily decorated World War II veterans. The dancers consisted of the Arapahoes, Colorado Indian leaders, and the Boulder citizens in attendance. The decision to paint the Sand Creek Massacre had been painful for Eugene. Painful not only in the subject itself and the people involved, but also because it might alienate some Indian viewers. Nonetheless, as witnessed that day, truth, honesty, and openness among people can bring them together. The oral tradition of his grandfathers and uncles and Eugene's simple but eloquent translation of that tradition into a painting on elk hide allows observers to begin to sense the depth of emotion experienced by Sand Creek descendants and therefore allow and encourage the healing between peoples. I'd like to close by saying it has truly been an honor to have worked with Eugene, his family, the Northern Arapaho Business Council, and the Arapaho people. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tom.